And there's the live button, all right? So I always like to remind people when they go to our videos to go to our website at L yitl.org that's lovingthelord.org abbreviated right of course we are a college heights baptist church that's that's our uh, uh what we really are as a church but loving the lord is our outreach ministry and there's just so much information on there loopy that can help so many people uh that's going to be going it could it's going to be a blessing to and i know the, the other day that i know the other day that brother james and i were able to uh uh, meet with a man and, and invited him to church. So uh, it's just God starting to open some doors. And so we're excited about that. So if we were an investigator, if we were an investigator and asked ourselves the question, uh, what were the events that led to the rich man going to hell? What were the events? Okay. So if you will, please turn to Luke chapter 16 verse 19 through 31. And I think it's very, very important that you and I really become very aware of getting the gospel out in these last days. It's not about going to a Bible study. It's not about just going and learning some scriptures. But it's like, how am I preparing myself to become uh, a disciple for Jesus Christ? And what is a disciple? They were to carry the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ out into the world. Did you know that, Lupe, that the average Christian today, even though they go to church, uh, in the last five years has never even tried to even or attempt to try to lead somebody to Jesus Christ? They haven't even had a conversation. And so we've really got to step it up. Why? Because <coughs> eternity is real. And, and we've got to take it serious. So turn, if you will, to like says Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And we're going to be talking about, once again, what were the events that led up to the rich man going to hell, okay? And so here we go, uh, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. Now underline that. I know he uses the word certain, but we want to look at his life. And what was his life? He was clothed in what? Purple and fine linen. And, uh, and he what? He fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate full of sores, and designed to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the, uh, uh, the rich man's table. Uh, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels I'm sorry, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried uh, uh, by the angel into Abraham's bosom. And it says the rich man also died and was what? Buried. There's a big distinction there. So we're, we're talking about, think about it. Guys, even if you live to be 70 or 80 years old, that is nothing compared to eternity. I mean, we've got... A, just a few years to prepare and get this thing right, okay? And he says in verse 23, <coughs> and in hell he lifted up his eyes, uh, being in torments, knows the T and the S, plural, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, look at this, that he may what? Dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. All right? So we know, Tigger, that, that we know that sin, uh, the sin dead of Adam and Eve, had put man in a position to be separated from God. Correct? All right? But, and we also know that unbelief, unbelief, and the rejection of God uh, sends the soul to hell. Right? But consider these thoughts. If we were an investigator and said, what were the events that led up to uh, the rich man going to hell? And, and are we duplicating some of those events in our life? And if so, we don't want to make the same mistake that he made. All right. So number one, write this down. He says in verse 19, <coughs> and he fared sumptuously every day. What does it mean? Number one, he was too busy making money to think about God. 
Now you say, well, I don't have a whole lot of money. Yeah, but we, look how much time we actually spend just having to go to work, at work, getting ready for work, coming home from work, and then trying to get a few things together, and then we go to bed, right? And so we get in this routine and this rut, and Star, I'm glad to have you. So in Luke chapter 16, if we were an investigator, we said, well, what were the events that led up to him dying and going to hell, all right? And like I said, we've already established the fact that, Lady Carol, that it's because of sin and, and the rejection of Christ and unbelief that uh, uh, because people don't put their faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ to save them, that, that the conditions for heaven were lost, but the conditions for hell, they were met, all right? In fact, the Bible tells in the book of Revelation that just being an unbeliever, just being an unbeliever, all right, uh, is enough for a person to, to miss God and, and to go to hell. So in Proverbs chapter 28, uh, verse number uh, 20, but he that maketh haste, now watch this, to be rich shall not be innocent. Can you imagine saying this, Brother James? Well, God, you know, I, I was so busy providing for my family. I was trying to do a good thing. Libby, can you imagine? Well, God, you know that, that we had so many mouths to feed. And I had to work a lot of hours to make sure everybody was fed. But the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 20, that our excuses, Tigger, aren't going to hold up. He says, why? But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be what? Innocent. So, and, and so our excuse, but God, I, I was just so busy working at my job or my career. And, uh, and yet... <coughs> We know that his pride helped keep him from God. He said, I can do this on my own. I don't need God. I, I fare sumptuously every day. I got all the money I need. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, some of you are very blessed. Most of us are. And, uh, but boy, uh, whenever you get, when you lose your health, guess what you also lose? Your ability to work and to earn an income. And it doesn't take long after about two and a half to three weeks for that to stack up and the pressure's on, right? Unexpected, unexpected, uh, an unexpected illness, you know, unexpected problems. So let's go back, <coughs> number one, he was just too busy, too busy making money. And then the second thing I noticed about his life is number two, his pride uh, helped keep him from God. His pride, all right? Let's go back and read. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse uh, 26 through 31. And listen carefully, because we don't want to make the same mistakes, right? And he says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. And why is that? Tigger, I believe it's because sometimes we get it in our head that we're smart enough bright enough, intelligent enough. We don't need to read about God. We don't need to read about the things of God. You know, I can figure it out on my own. And so he says, "For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men, not many wise men, after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And, and, and base things, that means the lowest of the low. So circle that word base if you're at that point uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 26, verse 28. And he says, and a base things of the world and things that are despised has God chosen. Yea, all these and, and, and these things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So Victoria, imagine we get to heaven and we say, well, you know, God, I appreciate you going to Calvary and all that stuff, but I really didn't need you. I got here on my own. And so he says, no flesh should glory in his presence. Okay. So, uh, verse 30, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. There it is. He says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, sanctification, here it is, redemption. Redemption is where our sins have been paid. Our sins are covered. They've been washed away. 
And he says, verse 31, that according as is written, he that glorieth, uh, let him glory in the Lord. So uh, the only way, Jaden, that I can say when I get to heaven, I'm only here because of God. God provided salvation. God saved me. God wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. He's the one that shed the blood for me. So when I get to heaven, it's not because I deserve it. It's not because I earned it. It's because of God's grace. All because of God. All right? So number one, he was too busy making money. Number two, his pride helped him, uh, that kept him from God. And because remember in verse 19, he had what? Lots of money. And then Mark 12, 37. David, therefore himself, called him called him Lord, and went for uh, is he then his son? Now watch this. And the common people heard him gladly. You see, a lot of people that uh, seem to be apparently educated in a lot of areas, they don't think they can learn anything. They think they're too smart. And you know, as I get older, uh, it don't take long, Brother James, to realize, man, I can be one of the dumbest guys on the block. I used to think I had all figured out. But I don't, you know. And, and so, number one, he was too busy making money. Number two, his pride. A lot of people uh, won't get saved because they're not willing to humble themselves before God and say, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. All right? And then number three, he trusted uh, too much in his wealth or his resources. Verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. He says, you know, if I need it, I can provide it for myself. But Mark 10, 24 says, and the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again, again and said unto them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? And so, once again, he trusted too much in his resources, too much. You know, somebody says, well, you know, I've been a member of this church for 42 years. Well, the church didn't die for you. It didn't shed its blood for you. You say, well, man, I, I've known my pastor. Uh, he's an old guy. And, and when I remember when he first came to our church, I stuck with him. Hey, I can't save you. Does that make sense? Ryan, the other day, you, uh, you said you got saved and, and then you, you wanted to take a step up and, and make a public profession of faith, of baptism, and Brother James did everything he could to keep you under as long as he could, <laughs> you know? But boy, before that last bubble went out, he came up, you know, and whoo, hallelujah, you know? He had that Jesus experience all over again, all right? And so I'll never forget, I love watching, if you go to YouTube and put in funny baptism movies, I think one of the funniest ones is the 11 year old kid, the pastor's in, in there, and all of a sudden he said, come on in son, and he did a cannonball. <laughs> I mean a cannonball, you know? So the pastor got baptized that night, okay? <laughs> so, but, but we ought to take baptism seriously because it's a picture of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What else is it? It's our first step of profession that I'm a child of God. I have put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, bearing His likeness, raised to walk in what? Newness of life. A lot of people will go to church or get baptized, but they miss that. See, there ought to be a change in lifestyle. Does that make sense? But a lot of people don't want to change their lifestyle. That's one of the problems of the rich man. He liked his lifestyle, all right? He trusted too much in his wealth. And so, uh, once again, in verse 19, he was clothed with what? Purple and fine linen. That was people who were, that was a status symbol, that they were very, very rich, okay? And then uh, Mark 10, 24, I just read, but Jesus answered again and said to them children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches? Did you get that? Then same thing about a rich man, but those who what? Trust in riches, enter into the kingdom of God, all right? Because they don't see their need for God. And then number four, if we were an investigator, and we were trying to figure out what led to the events that led up to the rich man going to hell. Well, number four, the good things of life, no doubt, helped to what? Hinder him. The good things hindered him. 
Verse 25, Abraham said, Son, remember that in thy lifetime, thy received the good things. You know, it's been many times I would, in fact, verse 19, he had nice clothes. We know that. And plenty of food, verse 21. It's amazing to me how many times, uh, Lady Carol, I'll, I'll turn back around and, and say, hey, listen, can you, can you come worship with us uh, on a Sunday or a Wednesday or you know, Sunday morning? Be, well, we got family coming over. We've got business people coming over. We've got a barbecue coming over. Well, shoot, let me know. I'll bring the church out to you. Amen. Amen. And, uh, but, but we let little things get in the way. And I'm, I've really been amazed as a pastor, uh, like on Christmas, that's supposed to be dedicated. We want to really dedicate that day to remembering the birth of a Savior. But most people miss church. And then we have Thanksgiving. And Victoria said, same thing. They, they don't get, well, we're, I got this turkey to cook. You know? Well, these should, these should be events that are special days that we make Jesus Christ absolutely special. Right? But we neglect that. Why? The good things of life often help hinder us. Okay? So, nice clothes, plenty of food. Number five. I told you it's going to be a fairly short sermon tonight. He was brought up in a home without God. Now, I want you to let that sink in for a moment. And look back verse 28. Let's go back and look at verse 28, if you will, with me. And uh, uh, he says in verse 28, then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him, talking about Lazarus, to my what? My father's house. And, and he said that for a reason. For I have how many, Lupi? Five brethren, that they may testify unto them, lest they also come in this place of torment. See, we forget. When it, if you go back and really do a study about hell, and the outer darkness, man, that's, that's scary stuff to think about, right? And then you go back and think about, well, you know, I, I just turned 64. And the average lifespan of, of a man is 70 to 75. So 70, that means I, the clock's ticking on me and everything else. And then I'm looking at all eternity, forever, forever and ever. So... I want you to think that the same thing, the same clock that's ticking on me, Michaela, it's ticking on you, you know, and, uh, and everybody else here. And we're going to stand before God, and we're going to have to give what? An account for our life. So, but he was brought up in a home without God. This is why I, I encourage mom and dads, don't just send your children to church. Take them to church. And then whenever you go home, have church. Does that make sense? Take time to get the Bible stories out, especially when they're young, because their hearts are tender, their minds are curious, and the Holy Spirit is able to work with that environment. But as we get older, I know you don't believe this, but I think Loopy got stubborn. <laughs> I think I got stubborn, right? I got, Brother James, I don't know about you, but I got hard-headed. You know, it was my way. Or the highway, right? But when you're a child, you trust uh, the parents. So it's very important that while our hearts are tender and young, that we make sure <coughs> that we fill up the knowledge of God's Word in their mind and in their heart. Because if we don't do that, the devil's going to make sure that their mind and heart is filled with something else. You know? And I've, I've always voiced my opinion, uh, my concern, I should say, about the cell phones and and all the game cards and all that, uh, you know, and, and I'd encourage you. It's okay, I mean, you know, to do those things. But when you come to church, focus on the Word of God. Now, there are some of you that, that your cell phone becomes a digital Bible, and you're doing well with that. You're using it, and you're using it as a tool. Does that make sense? But I see a lot of people today that are so distracted and they're texting and they're doing all this stuff. Uh, I saw some funny videos the other day. Uh, I like watching funny videos. And I like to take and, and type in funny videos of people walking and texting. And it's amazing. They walk into a, a, a telephone pole. 
That there was one with a manhole there. They're texting away and they're gone, you know. And, but, you know, that's serious business, right? And so, but it's so easy to get distracted. And uh, the little thing you hold in your hand can be a big distraction, okay? So think about that. It's the little things that distract. It's not the big things. It's the little things, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> but he was brought up in a home without God. So let me ask you this. Do you think his parents ever prayed with him? Probably not. You think they ever sat down and, and uh, read some of the Old Testament scriptures to him? No. You think anybody ever just set him aside and tried to get his attention about, hey, there's eternity out there. You need to think about this. Probably not. Why? He was not raised in a home uh, that talked about God. So here we are today, and uh, it still blows my mind, even on Christmas Day. Uh, we get up, we grab the toys, we have the meal, watch the football game. And most of the time, our children never stop and put everything aside and just get to hear the Christmas story and the prayer and to give thanks. And same thing at our, at our tables when we eat. Uh, it's like, you know, you know, down the throat, over the gums, here it comes, you know, all that stuff. But to be thankful for what we got. Every morning I wake up, uh, it's just something I do. I want to acknowledge that if it wasn't for God, <clears throat> the Creator, my Father, I would not have a life. He gave me life, okay? The other day they said, you know, if they can find bacteria on Mars, it's proof of life. And yet we were up to the last moment having abortions. Now, I don't know about you, that don't seem right to me, does it to you? And so I was so thankful to hear that Lubbock became a sanctuary city. Is that going to stop it? No. But it's a start, right? And so what are you saying? Life ought to be valuable. So I thank God the Father, and you might want to try it. Say, God, if it wasn't for you, you know, I would not have had this opportunity of life. And it's been a journey for me. I made a lot of mistakes along the way. Can anybody else say an amen, hallelujah, and oh me, right? But I'm learning. And, uh, but once again, life. And then I tell Jesus, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross, shedding your blood, and giving me everlasting life. God gave me life, at God the Father. And God the Son gave me everlasting life. And I always remember that if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, I'd really be in a mess. So I thank the Holy Spirit for every day empowering my life, helping me to think better, love better, act better, you know? But have you noticed that when you get out of church, you have a tendency to what? You don't read the Bible. You don't pray. There's a lot of things you miss out on. They've, you lose those things as a priority. And so uh, there's a deal we posted uh, on Facebook the other day, and it, and it says, you know, don't get mad and quit your church because your pastor corrected you. You'd want a pastor that says, hey, that's the wrong path. You're going the wrong way. You're doing the wrong things. And, and you're just going to lead you into trouble. Isn't that what parents do for their children? If they're a good parent, you know? And it's like, you know, that one little baby, it wanted that flower so bad as a bouquet of flowers. And the daddy was holding it. And boy, it was screaming. It was hollering. Now, Michaela, you don't know anything at all about a baby that screams and hollers, right? You know, I want my way. In other words, little baby. And so while he was talking, having a conversation, the, the little bitty uh, baby had leaned over. And there's a big old huge sunflower. It reached in and grabbed that sunflower, not knowing there was a bumblebee on the inside. And sure enough, it got stung. See, even the innocent is unaware of the sting of sin. And things that we never thought, I, I never thought I'd be in this situation. I never thought I'd do those things. But... Isn't it amazing how we get caught up? Because sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and what? Cost you more than you're willing to pay. And I'm living proof of that. Maybe you are too, I don't know. But I, I say it with humility, and I say it uh, with sadness that I, I'm one of those hard knocks Christians. You know, I had, you could tell me all day long, but I, I'm normally the one that's going to mess up. And I'm going to have to learn the hard way. 
And I have learned a lot of things the hard way. But it's probably brought up uh, with, without, being, without God uh, in their home. And then number six, he refused, here it is, to hear the, God's prophets. Look at verse 29. Let's go back to that. And he says, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them <coughs> hear them. Today, most people refuse to really listen to the preacher. They refuse to listen to the, 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 those that are trying to educate you on the Word of God, trying to help you. Uh, if you're depending on just for a pastor to educate you, then that pastor is going to make a mistake. You need the Holy Spirit of God guiding you through Scripture. So you should always pray, Holy Spirit of God, I'm about to listen to my pastor, and he's, he might make a mistake, so help guard my ears and my heart. And it's amazing, <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me, Victoria, uh, or Lady Victoria, how many people will come, like to our church for years, and all it takes is one sermon to make somebody mad, and now they're done. They don't want anything to do with the preacher, they don't want anything to do with the church, or God's people, and they're up and gone. We've seen that happen over and over and over. Why? Because they're not grounded. You know, I, I, I get my feelings wounded all the time. And that's when somebody says, oh, why? Right? And say, things don't always work out the way I want them to work out. And so what do you do? I trust God every day and let God work it out. So what are you doing? Uh, I don't know everything. And I don't know everything to do. So people say, well, preacher, what are we going to do? Well, I guess we're going to take and fast and pray. I guess we're going to take it before the Lord every day and see what doors he opens, okay? But he refused to hear the prophets, refused to hear the prophets. I was so proud to hear that some of you, that during the week, uh, not only do, have you listened to the sermons that we have, but you're reaching out and finding some good Bible teachers out there, and you're listening to their teaching on a regular basis. The more teaching we get from good Bible teachers, the better we're going to understand. So he was <coughs> brought up <coughs> in a home without God. He refused to hear God's prophets. And then last of all, number seven. Here it is. Ready? He rejected God and his word up the last minute. He rejected God and his word. John, John chapter 8. Now you can turn there. John chapter 8, verse 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. So don't, don't think that just because you went to church or just because you've got a degree in something or you've gained some knowledge, listen, uh, none of that's going to matter. It's going to take the blood of Jesus. It's going to take God not only applying the blood of Jesus, but having your sins washed away. And in Michaela, the Bible says that God has to put our name in the Lamb's book of life. And then the moment that you die, Jesus meets you, greets you, and takes you. That's why the thief on the cross said what? Remember me when thou goest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, today. So that means what? Jesus is going to remember him. He's going to keep his word. And you say, oh, but preacher, I got saved when I was really young. I even got baptized, but boy, have I made some mistakes. Well, I understand that, you know, and we all have, right? But you have to understand, too, that it wasn't by your non-mistakes that you got saved. Nor is it going to be because of your mistakes that you're not going to be saved. It's going to be because of what? John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh the Father but by me. So I think if there was ever a time that you and I, let's go back to verse 28. For I have five brethren that ye may testify unto them, lest they also come this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Think about that. If you went to the graveyard today and all of a sudden people started popping up, are you going to be religious at that point? <laughs> Probably not. Are you going to feel the conviction that you need Jesus? Probably not. And so he's saying, 
listen, if they're not willing to hear Moses, you know, the words of Moses and the prophets that I gave them for salvation while they're alive, they're not going to believe it, though one rose from the dead. Did you get that? And he says, they will what? Repent. Even the rich man in hell understood the requirements. And it's called repentance. Repentance is a change in heart, a change in mind, change in attitude. In other words, I understand that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I understand that Jesus is that Savior. Okay? And I understand that without you, I, unless you invite me, I can't go to your kingdom. So would you remember me? And what did Jesus say? Today thou be me in paradise. Verse 31, as we close this out. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses the prophets, neither way they be what? Persuaded the one rose from the dead. They're not going to be inspired. So how can we, how can we change this story for the people that we know? Not everybody's going to be you know, really rich. It's not about wealth, but it's about people missing out on understanding the inspiration of God. So there are people that you know that you're going to run across that will never come to this church. People you know that you work with and people across the street or whatever. And for whatever reason, they're going to be mad at some church, some preacher. Well, it's not about that. But they, they just need somebody to say, hey, do you understand that we're talking about eternity here? You know, I used to do that the number thing with people. If you live to be, you know, back then, if I lived to be 60, well, I passed that up four years ago. So I'm going for the 70. So that gives me six years. But what if I don't have six years? Well, I've only have one year. What if tomorrow is the last day I breathe on this earth? I need to get it right. And how do I get it right? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. And yet people today, it's amazing. Uh, even if they get saved, even if they get baptized, they'll go to church for a little while, but it's like they, they've, they've disconnected from Jesus Christ. They forgot that, hey, we owe him everything. And one of the things that, that, one of the easiest things that we can all do after salvation is what? Hebrews 10, 25, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but encouraging one another as <coughs> so much you see that day approaching. Do you understand? You going to church is not just about you. When I come to church, I know it's not about me just preaching. It's did, I, did, I, did God use me to educate them, to encourage them, to inspire them? You get what I'm saying, Ed? And so, and what if I don't go to church? Then I miss that opportunity to be there for you. You know, and, and Brother James, we have those Christian challenge coins. And they mean a lot, don't they? But, uh, and we, we handed out some more today. And people realize, hey, when I give my word, I need to keep my word. I need to follow up with my word. I need to do that. Does that make sense? So I think today that even with or without a challenge card, <coughs> I mean coin, <coughs> we should be willing to step up to the plate and meet the challenge of Jesus Christ. You know, Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, you know, that we're to go out and teach and baptize, and, and then we're to go out and train and make disciples. So it's not about how big of a church did God use us to build, because the, the, the number doesn't matter. The deal is how many people got saved, how many people fell under the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, how many people surrendered their life in order to present the gospel? How many people decided to become a disciple for Jesus Christ and to take it seriously? So think about that. Think about what I say, what I do, and how I act. It could hinder somebody else. In fact, go back and look up the word stumbling block in the New Testament. You say, oh, but preacher, I, it doesn't bother me to do this or that. Well, if you're around a lost person, the very thing that you take for granted could be the very thing <coughs> that might <coughs> keep them from wanting to trust Christ as their Savior. Think about that. It makes a difference what we say and what we do and, and all that. So I would encourage you, take a step back. Time is running out. 
And I don't want to go out into eternity uh, with some weird Facebook deal and, and you know, and it's like we put one post up that said this, make sure that when you talk to somebody today that you would have no regrets if they died tomorrow with what you said to them. That's big, right? Be kind to people, loving people, and, and be faithful to them. Does that make sense? So, hey, buddy, good to see you. That's my little preacher man coming up here helping me out to preach. That's pretty much him saying, preacher, it's time to shut it down. <laughs> all right. But, but we are glad to have all of you here. We encourage you to come back and visit physically at 4601 39th Street, right here in Lubbock, Texas. We have services, of course, at what? 11 o'clock, and we have services at 6 o'clock on Sunday, and then 7.30 on Wednesday. One of these days, we're going to have enough people and enough teachers and workers that we can start getting back to having Sunday school. We've got a bus that we'll be running it. Once we get it running, we'll be asking people to drive it, go get people. So what are you doing? We're in the last days. We've got to be out collecting souls for Jesus Christ. Jesus does all the saving. So what are you doing? to help make a difference, all right? So, Father, we love you. We ask for you to bless as you always do. And we thank you, number one, for being our God, giving us life. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity of everlasting life through you and your shed blood and your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming into our mind and our heart and our life, empowering us that we might be better witnesses and, and better disciples for you. And Lord, I just want to be a better man altogether in every way that I can, that I might bring glory and honor to your name. And I want to be found faithful. I look forward to that day when you say, in spite of my humanness, you say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Father, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, may they pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I understand I'm a sinner. I understand that you're the Savior. And only through you can I have a way to God. John 14, 6. So I'm a sinner. You're the Savior. And I'm asking you, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I'm asking you right now to remember me, to save me, not only just today, but for all eternity. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I give you praise, I give you glory, and I give you honor. So Lord, thank you again. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right.